first of all, I, I, I want to say I was wrong. I was right when I said I was over my pay grade. I, I'm not basically a theoretician. And the, I was drawing way too fine a line between technologies and platforms. Um, we can talk more about that later. Um, so this is going to be an extremely disjointed talk. Uh, partially because the discussion has been sort of in a good way all over the place. And I just sort of want to touch on some things I'm interested in. Plus, I'm going to show you the work I'm doing now, which um, I sort of I, we describe the Institute for the Future of the Book as a think and do tank, because I really believe that theory and practice go together. And I'm sort of more on the practice side, but we try to think about what we do as well. And uh, one last thing before I start is that we're, the Institute for the Future of the Book was really a, a five year MacArthur game, and it's over. Um, I'm now working, thank God, back in the sort of commercial sector and have a new company called Social Book, and that's what I'll show you. Um, I'm going to talk very fast so we can leave more time for conversation at the end. Um, if anything burning comes up in the middle, just raise your hand. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, this is the 100th year of Marshall McLuhan's uh, birth. And so uh, the word probe, by the way, comes from him. He sort of like to sort of, like, put these little ideas out there in the world and call them probes. So here's the first probe. <laughs> Jobs died all the way through Apple's announcement the other day. I find myself getting more and more annoyed with people sort of uh, what I would think sort of this incorrect uh, historical uh, generation lately. And the, because the problem with instant history is that it's constructed to serve the present and it's almost always wrong. And uh, I was so the the Alto in 1973, Alan Kay, Doug Engelbart, a whole bunch of guys at Xerox Park, they were mostly guys. Um, developed this machine which is pretty much did everything that your Macintosh can do today. It did it slower, uh, but it they, they, they had the whole sort of surround that we work in <coughs> nailed conceptually. And they built the first tools to do it. Uh, Steve Jobs is a genius marketer. There's fantastic footage you can find on the web of the discussion of Xerox Park of Steve's coming to visit Xerox and basically seeing the Alto and then going back and working with everybody else at Apple to do the, the first Macintosh. I'm not trying to take away from what Apple and Jobs did. I'm just trying to try to put it in perspective that uh, that phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants, was extremely true for them. Um, 1979, 
uh, Nick Negroponte, Andy, and Andrew Lipman at the Media Lab, uh, sort, of, sort of take these ideas further. And this one I can probably walk you through. Let me see if I can make it run. So this is 1979. The illustration for And uh, this is the first time anti alias text ever appears on a screen, as a television screen. Mm -hmm. And the page is text, but it's also text and video. Uh, this sort of blew my mind back in 1979, because it really, it was actually not so much the video on the page as much as it was the beautiful text on the page. Up until that moment, we'd always seen sort of ugly pea green on black or white text reversed out. Um, and they had just figured out anti-aliasing and they could make text look decent on the screen. Plus they put video on there. And if you look at the Apple announcement the other day, they're not doing a whole lot more than this. Which doesn't make what they're doing bad, it just means that somebody did it uh, 30 years ago. Um, and then in, uh, in 1987, we get HyperCard from Apple. And HyperCard, was an authoring tool that allowed you to do much more complex things than Apple's new iBook author demonstrates. Uh, I mean, you can't do the, the, the sexy rotations of the 3D objects, but you can do pretty much everything else plus an amazing amount more. Interestingly, if we're gonna look at history, one of the first things Jobs, Steve Jobs did when he came back from exile was kill HyperCard. HyperCard, to me, still is the one tool that was ever put out there that really allowed non-programmers to make something of note. Uh, the, it was, it, actually, if you look at the whole development of Apple, uh, in the last several years of the, the, the iPad and all the way now through to iBook Author, what you see is the shift from the conception of a computer as a production device to a consumption device. And I don't actually think this is a good thing. I, I'm not, I'm not, it's not simply that it's bad, but I, I think that we really need to sort of deeply understand uh, the tools and the platforms that we are building and how they fit into the kind of society we'd like to have. Um, <coughs> I, I don't like apps. This is probe number two, I think. Um, I, I don't like apps very much. I'm trying to think a lot about why, and I, I find, you know, so somebody will send me a new book app, uh, like, like all the ones Apple showed the other day, and my initial sort of gut, deep in sort of the bones of my body feeling is, these things are dead. There's just nothing going on here that couldn't be in a book. And it's not that I think that books are dead, but they are in a sense. Um, the, I, I was talking to, um, Greg yesterday, and I said something I've sort of never said before, but I think it's actually right. I'll get to it in a second, but one of the essences of these things is that they are fixed. You can't, they don't change. It, in a lot of ways, that's one of the things that's good about them, right? It has allowed people to have a conversation across time and space where I can talk about what Mark America said on page 104, 104 of this book. And 20 years later, you can go back to that book and you can find it. That's a really wonderful thing. But each book sort of lives in an island by itself. And the, the affordances of, once you start putting books, texts, I, by a text, I mean, a, a, a song can be a text, a movie can be a text. Once you start putting texts into a dynamic medium, uh, a, a 
the internet. The social possibilities come forward in a, in a very deep and dramatic way. Uh, being able to search and find something, being able to send that quote to somebody else, being able to Um, if I have this book in print form, I can find a reference and I can go to the library. And unless I'm writing my dissertation, I'm not doing that. It just takes too long. It's not possible. If, I'm, if, I, if I have this book in a browser, though, uh, I can just sort of type immediately. And within the same frame that I'm in, I can get to the other place I wanted to get to. Suddenly, the possibility of information and knowledge being linked in a fantastically deep way is here. And the whole thing about apps is they reproduce the separation of one book from the next. Um, I can't, uh, we live inside of an open web today. And anything that doesn't sort of, any presentation of content for me, that, that doesn't fit within that framework sort of is fighting against it. And I would say that the app world it, it is pretty much like that because we have you know, thousands or millions now of sort of islands unto themselves, just like in the book world. Um, but anyway, so what I said to Greg yesterday was that to me the fundamental aspect of print technology is that it's fixed. It doesn't change. And so apps don't change, but they do change, right? One of the things Apple says about their new system is <coughs> you can change the content and it gets uploaded automatically and so people have to change the content. But I, I realized that they just replaced one fixed bit of content with another fixed bit of content. And the thing that's really interesting about about content that is in the browser and not in the web, and that is fundamentally social, is that the human communication around the text becomes part of the text. The text continues to live, and that is really profoundly different. That is where we're going, and that is what's important. And for me, the whole app world especially the way Apple has been developing it, is simply a transposition of the mentality and paradigms of print into the electronic space. And it's backwards and frankly, it's reactionary from that perspective. Um, I can't play, this is a fantastic quote from McLuhan in 1977, basically saying that privacy is done. And uh, it, 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 the, the guys, I mean, he was, uh, as I was saying something before, he was a staunch, politically conservative person, but he understood in a deeper way than anybody else, I think, how profound the changes were going to be as we, as humans shifted from a print-inflected world to a digitally-inflected world. And he, did, and he did this actually without really having much experience with computers at all. He was really talking about television. Um, more than it was about computers, but uh, trust me, it's spot on. So uh, I've been at this for 30 years, and the first, the first 15 years or so were spent thinking about how the notion of the page was going to change as we added audio and video to it, sort of expanding the notion in that way. And I, it was nice that uh, David showed yesterday the uh, little logo that we got in 1984, the book turning into the disc. The interesting thing about that was that, sh to me today, that shows to me how deeply my thinking was still completely in the print world. In other words, I was shifting from one fixed, solid object 
to another fixed solid object. And that was really where we were. I mean, the future of the book was going to be just like the past of the book, except the pages were going to have audio and video on them. Um, it took me a, a really much longer time. It wasn't until we started the Institute in 2004, and I was working with all these fantastic young, uh, young people who had just graduated from university, and where we started to understand that as important as multimedia is, and I don't in any way want to sort of discount its importance, that the location of texts in a dynamic medium and, and the ability there to make books places where people congregate was going to be more, more important in the long run than simply adding audio and video. I don't want to say simply, than adding audio and video code to a page. Um, and I think, you know, that social reading has become, over the last five years, a, a, an increasingly popular meme. There are dozens and dozens of startups. Uh, Amazon, you know, lets you know how many people have underlined the passage. Um, I was actually really afraid, in some ways, that Apple was going to announce a big social reading uh, module on iBooks. In retrospect, I realize now how silly that was for me to think that because their DNA just doesn't sort of get there. It's not what they do. Um, and so, but for, for me, social reading, I think people talk about social reading as if you, you can sort of graft something social onto the typical uh, concept of a book. And I actually don't think that's true. I don't think, if I look forward going, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, I don't see social reading as, a, as, a, as an option. I see it really as the, the foundational cornerstone of the new media ecology. Um, in 1992, when we published the first electronic books at Voyager, uh, John Scully, who was running Apple, then uh, used to fly me around the world so I could lie down on stages and show how I could read a book in bed with the uh, power book at the time. And publishers would see this and they'd say, oh, that's really cute, Bob. You know, once again, you can show yourself to, you know, be doing things that um, are nifty but have, no, have nothing to do with our core businesses today. And so fast forward from 1992 to 2008, it takes 16 years for Amazon to come up with the, the Kindle. And it's interesting, and, and then all of a sudden, everybody, publishers particularly, start to realize, oh, they're actually, this, this, this electronic reading actually might have some, some legs here. It's interesting to me, it took 16 years, I think largely because hardware is very hard, and it took 16 years to get to the point where somebody could carry around a device that was just good enough that people actually would buy them and use them. And again, the whisper sync was a crucial part of the, that platform. Uh, I don't think it's, oh, well, two things. One is, if publishers had sort of in 1992 looked at what I was doing and thought, well, okay, Bob, you're, 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 you're 16 years ahead, but we should actually start working on 16 years from now, the world might look very differently today. I mean, a consortium of publishers certainly could have done what Amazon did, but didn't. And you wouldn't necessarily have a publishing industry that is in such complete disarray and, frankly, on its, you know, on its deathbed, as far as I'm concerned. Um, secondly, what took 16 years to go from uh, the first electronic books to, to the Kindle, it's not going to take us 16 years to go from now to really fantastic social reading platforms. Uh, my, when I get really megalomaniacal, and, uh, I, 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 my pitch to some extent to the investors these days is, Give me five to ten years, and I can build a platform that is more significant than Amazon and Apple in terms of publishing. Because I do believe that if you go, if you look deeply into the core 
of what Amazon and Apple and Google are all doing, they all are basically uh, rendering the paradigms of print in the, tech, in, in, in the digital space. And it's probably how we have to invent the future by reinventing the past the way they are, but it is not going to be, in fact, the way that the future is going to look 15, 20 years from now. It's going to look quite different, and, and, and social is going to be at its core. Um, when we talk about social reading, we're not just talking about changing the reading experience by itself. We're talking about changing the entire ecosystem, how, book, how things are created, how they're how they're purchased, how they're consumed, how they're distributed, how they're shared. Everything is going to change. Um, so the, the new company is Social Book. Um, let me get out of here. So I'm going to show you what we're doing. Um, first of all, everything is in the browser, right? 100% in the browser. For lots of reasons, the most important, of course, is the openness of it. Uh, the second would be uh, having been through the uh, Macintosh version, Windows version, Macintosh color, Macintosh not color, uh, Android, you know, iOS versioning problems. What an amazing waste of time, especially now that we have HTML5 to make beautiful stuff in the browser. So um, I'm going to show you some of the, a bunch of things pretty quickly here. Um, so I'm not sure why I started with this one. Um, of course, it opens up on the last page, which is where I was in that book. Um, so I want to show you that we 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 have in fact. that these books all do can contain audio and video is sort of a nail bad aspect already. Um, next. Uh, there's something in another language. Oh, I have to browse section. Let me have this in my library again. Or a So one of the great things about having a book in a browser is that it asks if it's in another language if you want to translate it. And uh, the person who wrote this essay saw the translation and uh, sorry, I pushed the button too quickly. Um, anyway, the translation is pretty is good enough for its service. I've experimented with it now with colleagues in Japan where I've sent them, they sent me a document in Japanese, I can read it in English, I comment in English, they read my comment in Japanese, they answer in Japanese, I read their answer in English. Uh, this, I mean, th this is a mind-boggling development that to think that language is about to disappear as a significant boundary in communication around, around texts. Um, so let me show you how this works a little bit. Let me go to um, So this is a we just started using this with your real people. And this is a class in uh, advanced Spanish. Uh, so this is a class in advanced Spanish, and these are the 13 people in this group. And um, the, what's what's been fantastic. Show you one. So, <laughs> sorry, this is not the right way to show this. Um, yeah, 
if I make a comment in here, it's going to screw up their class. Not a So this is a, I, I took five reviews of Bill Colia and put them into a little book and I sent it to a friend of mine who I'd like to talk about this stuff with. And the, we sort of nailed uh, threaded conversations and She'll get a notice that I've, that I've put something in here. And it, it's extremely easy to do this, right? And here are the things that I can't, that I will say to you, but you won't believe it until you try it. This is hugely, having a discussion in the margin of a document is extremely different than having a discussion about the document. You, you read very differently when you are, when you realize that you're going to, to write something and what you write here could make a difference. Uh, true story, um, I know a lot about the Amazon uh, page that we all have for Kindle stuff. And I know about it because I'm part of an experiment where, I guess it's just called a public experiment, called Findings, where if you give them permission, they strip all of your uh, Amazon underlinings and, and notes and put them into a public space where other people can see them. So I got an email one day saying that Dana Boyd, sort of a sort of Gujarati uh, celebrities, had copied a note that I had written into a book of Douglas Rushkoff's, into a book that she had written. And I went, oh my god, I'm reading with her, but not in the sense of, I didn't know she was reading the book, I don't even know Dana, right? But suddenly I realized that we were connected and that, that because my comments were available publicly but available on the page, as it were, that it was possible for us to have a conversation, either a direct conversation or an indirect one where she just copies out my stuff and puts it into hers. And so I now find that when, when, I mark some, when I'm reading something and I start to mark it up, I'm aware that, there, that other people are going to, to see my comments and also, I'm aware that my granddaughter, 20 years from now, is going to be able to see my comments. That she'll be able to swap, you know, she'll be reading Tale of Two Cities, and she'll be able to swap out whatever notes she's, she's looking at for my notes. I have to, you know, we, we, we're developing this sort of this longitudinal sense of conversations. Conversations don't just take place in real time or over the course of a the day. They can take place over many, many years. We know that, I mean, books do that now, right? I mean, Books will reference something that was written 40 years ago. Um, but we're talking now about the conversation becoming part of the book. Um, this is my, my group that's discussing this, the three of us. But there's also a community tab. Now, the community tab, this was just a bunch of tests, and I, Susan Sontag doesn't know she's dead, but when you're, when you're designing stuff, you can test with whoever name you want. Um, I was going to say that would have been very interesting. Right. So, well, although, although we are assuming that we will go get lots of annotated books by famous people and we will capture their annotations and put them, make them available to people. Um, so actually, let me run this down to you. So you, you have my group. My group is the discussion that I'm having with these two people. Community brings in any, all the conversations from the, from the ether 
that are relative, 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 relative to this page and puts them here. And I can respond to these people here if I want. There are two tabs you don't see here. One is called Gloss. And the Gloss tab is basically what allows, um, I could mark, actually I don't put it this way. I'm dying to find an historian who actually knows something about the historical period that Hell of Tales of Cities covers. I want that historian to mark up this book, and then I want to export their annotation, their annotations as a gloss that somebody else could import into their copy of Tale of Two Cities. So this idea that you could have an intelligent guide, in fact, many intelligent guides, uh, you could have two people arguing their way through a book, and that could be exported and then imported as a gloss. You know, sort of an endless number of ways to uh, uh, cast this. The fourth tab that you don't see here is uh, basically one where the author, the editor, or the publisher can communicate directly with the readers uh, in the margin of the book. They can announce that, uh, that uh, Mark America is doing a, a tour next week, um, a virtual tour, and he's going to give a talk. If you've got the copy of the book, you can just uh, you know, they open the book and he'll be there. Uh, an author could be um, subscribed to participate in the book group for the course of, of a month. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, the one of the most important things we've done here is try to make it really easy to to make a book. Um, I was inspired during Jay's talk this morning um, by the Robert Hoover piece and the response to it, and so I went and found those on the web and. I just went and I went to the websites, I copied the text, and I made a, pasted it into pages and made an EPUB. Um, uh, upload that. And then I made a cover for it also. And I think that's the cover. Yeah. And then I, I could write a bunch of metadata here. I'm not going to do that. Um, I can publish it privately or publicly. If I publish it privately, it means that it doesn't appear in the public browse section, so that basically I'm the only one who can start a group around it. And I, so I'm going to publish this privately. And I'm going to start a group. I'm going to start to enter names, um, uh, and and then create that group. And here's this book that I, you know, I made it this morning in two seconds while I was listening to Jay, and this is all functional. And as soon as Bob comes to this book, he'll see my comments, etc. And if we decide we want to invite four more people, uh, we just go here. What's this one called? Yeah, the books. Uh, yeah. Oops, sorry. Edit books. Edit this list. And I can just go and add, add more people to it. Um, one of the fun things we've done lately is Scientific American. Uh, if I go to a page here, um, our physical constants are really constant. Um, we go to the print version here. Uh, I'm going to go here to. Upload to social book. It just made a copy. I mean, it just did that on the fly. Took the content of that web page and made a a copy of that book that I could invite people to. Mm -hmm. um, 
And eventually, we think we'll be able to wrap, I mean, there are lots of things we'll do eventually, we'll be able to wrap this functionality on the sides of any web page. You won't even, you won't even have to put it in the social book form, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think I'll stop here with them, have a conversation. If anybody wants to uh, start using this, um, send me an email, and we'll let you into the system. Do you remember about the future of the book? Do you remember about seven years ago, Microsoft had the capability, if you were on an Exchange server, to insert tags on any web page, and then they just did away with it. You could, you could, you could just hit a button called Discuss in IE, and boom, it was a, it's just a little filter that skimmed on top of the tags. I mean, there must be. And I don't know why they did away with it. It was not, I mean, this is better. It has a lot more features, but it's weird that they did away with it. There, there are a lot of those out there right yeah. now. A lot of mechanisms for doing a close reading on a web page. Yeah. My sense is that, and this may be my conservatism showing, is that I like having. I like reading in a slightly more controlled environment like this than I do on any web page. Partially because I don't like having to figure out the different vocabularies of layout on each web page. I, I know I'm wrong here. Okay, I know that my 20-year-old, you know, friends will don't you, have those problems. Will you be embedding that capability audio for audio comments? Or yes, yeah, audio. Because that would be nice. Because you're in a rush, right? Well, actually, we'll make it so that you can embed. I mean, we will probably make it so that you can embed a browser, a live browser, um, because we've, we've done that some, in some other places. Um, the, I, what's the rule of thumb? If you can imagine it, we'd probably like to do it. It's just a question of time and money. Oh, I'd, I'd love to. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I Terry. Uh, Terry gets his time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize, Terry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Um, all right. Our respondent is uh, Terry. What's going on with that? Yeah, I know what's going Same on. Same version. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. It's a real one. Okay. Anyway, so you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to bear with me because I'm working on two screens at once. And that could be so much problem. This, in fact, is the wiki that I'll speak about at some point. Um, There, in fact, is my response. Okay, I want to thank Bob for his entertaining, provoking talk. Uh, I think social book's really important. I could emulate some of it in my own teaching, in a kind of limited way. It's a pleasure and honor to share uh, the podium with someone whose contributions have been long and essential to our field. Uh, uh, I guess I'm last up, except for the moderators. I want to thank the other superb scholars who have made the last two days extraordinarily stimulating, very generative, and especially to thank the members of the Digital Assembly whose dedicated efforts have made the event possible. It's, uh, it's very good to have fine colleagues and students, and also, let me say up front, uh, students are our colleagues. Um, this image here, my erstwhile uh, colleagues and uh, this image, uh, my, my colleagues and students know um, my interest in such things as this. Um, you see that at all? Very well. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it really should be bigger. But if you dim the lights, uh, those can matter a lot better. Anyway, um, this is. This is um, um, Antonella da Messina's Jeromanist study. It's uh, 1475. You get a better view there. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big, uh, a big thing. Um, so, so my students and colleagues are familiar with my interest in images such as this of solitary readers at work in their carols amid a farrago of texts and uh, tools for writing and editing, their eyes and hands directed as he is in the middle of this image here. Um, to the surface for reading or writing that sits at the imaginative center of the image. Uh, they're a species of an important genus of, 
of images that Lisa discussed yesterday that depict the readerly agents in the scene of reading. And beginning around the Quattrocento, there are scores of such images of a new kind of scholars in their studies. I think there's signs of an ongoing revolution of reading practice that's associated with the impending mechanization of textual production and its techniques and responsibilities. The most common are like this of Jerome, the father of the church, translator of the Vulgate, and this uh, pictorial tradition's primary figure of the master reader, the, the master comparative reader. So we have a lot of images of this kind. Um, Uh, such as this one here, oh, that's so slow. Uh, Jerome and his study uh, by Domenico Ghirlanda, Ghirlandaio, uh, it's, a, it's a fresco in the church of uh, Santi in, in Florence. And I'm sorry, I apologize for the, the small size of it. Uh, there's a lot going on in these images. Um, there are, for example, allegorical apparatus that are of theological significance. But I want to draw your attention to the textual disorder of these images of Jerome's study which I take to be a sign of the undisciplined, that is the undisciplinable sociality of comparative reading. Um, the way that the texts have of alluding, citing, recuperating, repeating, of crossing into productive and inconsistent tangles and larger and more extensive systems, which the painter is only able to figure by putting some clutter in the study. One more image of this kind because uh, it has to be particularly beautiful, but also it tells us something. Else. Um, this is Jerome and his study from a, a book on the life of Jerome, dated from 1515. Um, such images often include, just, just about see it, right to, uh, to my right of, of Jerome. They often include a modest prop alongside the scholar's desk, in this case a kind of small reading wheel that he can reach over and turn so that he can access more than one book at a time. And he can do comparative readings between volumes with the same ease as he might do between uh, moving pages, lines, and syntagma. These devices figure the responsibilities of the master reader caught in the ground. They're techniques for uh, ordering the disorder and redirecting textual sociality into new productive forms, or gaining some control of the sociality of texts. I was reminded of these images of Jerome and his textual apparatus this week as I was watching promotional videos from Apple for their new uh, textbook initiatives. Uh, I'm not going to play a video, but I'm going to show you a couple of still images. Um, what we have in these images, um, they come up, are uh, kids, bright young kids, uh, reading um, in rapt attention to the beautifully rendered, manipulable reading surfaces of digital textbooks. And behind them are shelves and corridors and dead tree media, slightly out of focus, probably suggesting both their relevance and their disappearance and their irrelevance. Uh, but there's something missing that I find worrying in these images. Uh, these kids are reading at the same time, but they're not reading together. They're not reading collectively. They aren't looking over each other's shoulder, or they're not talking about what they're reading. I suppose they might be reading the same electronic sources, but there's nothing here to indicate that there's a shared reading encounter, or there's a consequence that they're making something new out of parsing, reordering, uh, shared corpus. Um, what's missing is something that belongs to as expressive of the sociality of reading. These images and all the shiny promotional material of the Apple Initiative give no sense that new collective textual forms are generated through their use. Uh, these objects, which would be the basis of other iterative readings and acts of collection, reappropriation, generation, and so on. So, so for example, um, I'm showing this image in two stages. This charming young woman, uh, who is uh, sort of at the neat point of the video, she's she's reading from her iPad in a library. It'll come up. So she's reading, and and, and the camera pans from from her and the, and the beautiful uh, books in the background to show us what she's holding, what is keeping her in rapt attention. And of course, it's an iPad textbook. Um, she might be, so you have to envisage the camera moving. Uh, she might be an avatar of our modern Jerome, but I don't have any sense that the books in soft focus in the background belong to the textual system of the iPad, except in an incidental way. Or the electronic textbook materially connects her to a more general social relation with other readers, such that as Jerome, Jerome 
you know, 1,500, 1,600 years earlier, observed with his own reading and writing, that she would never, she would no longer be certain of which reading encounter she had had was hers and hers alone, and which belonged to somebody she couldn't identify. For all her purported connectedness, uh, she's more solitary than he was. Her iPad is more like an app than Jerome's experience of sacred and profane literatures. Um, her solitude is the problem of social book right? I mean, the problem that, that I'm talking about. The sociality of text is the foundation of the sociality of reading, or rather these two expressions of the social bonds of language are knotted in such a way that we can't assign, assign priority of one over the other. Reading is irreducibly and generatively something that happens, even when it happens in seeming isolation, always in relation to other readers. Reading is a social relation. This has always been true. Jerome understood that. And it may be true with some new valences in the digital field in what Greg calls the electorate condition of speech. And so when Ted Nelson said some time ago, and keeps reminding us over and over again, that everything is deeply intertwingled, it's an observation about the irreducibility of intertextuality in the docuverse, but also the irreducibility of readerly engagement and indexing in the social bond of language. So I hazard a, a prescription then for the condition of reading the digital field in part prompted by Bob's uh, talk and discoveries. Um, we should seek books, future books or futures of books, an apparatus for reading books, especially in the pedagogical scene, that effectively engage and extend the sociality of text and the sociality of reading, collective reading, conflicted reading, interrupted, extensive, aggregative reading. Reading that makes one uncertain of which reading encounter was ours and ours alone or someone else's that we can't identify, because that seems to me the more generative, the more innovative apparatus of the textual imaginary in the digital field. Uh, it's a local form of the talking back of the multitude that Jay and Bob discussed this morning and a real possibility for uh, constructive, generative work. Um, very briefly, and I don't want to take up too much time, I want to talk a bit about what I've been doing locally here to try to make this happen in some of my courses, uh, to foster collective aggregative reading, even interrupted and conflicted social reading. I'm basing all my courses now, graduate and undergraduate courses, on the construction and extension of wikis including courses, and in a way, especially courses in which there's no otherwise no emphasis on the need. So my literature courses, my English courses, um, also use these tools and use these tools centrally. It's very early in the semester, so I haven't got a lot to show you. This is, this is uh, the, the wiki for my new media course, some of which uh, some of uh, the students of which are here today, and I apologize for making the public giving case, but in any case, um, what happens in this scenario is, and I won't go through all this because it won't take a lot of time, but there are already uh, dozens of pages just after a week uh, created in this. All lecture notes, all supporting digital materials, and all student writing assignments or written communications between students are aggregated in the way. That's not particularly interesting. Yeah, there's nothing to do about that. It's a bit more varied and dense, perhaps, than most uses. What's mattered most is that the revisionary and aggregative logic of the wiki is fundamental to the course. It's, in fact, the rationale of the course. Um, the print fiction that we're reading, frankly, it's an excuse for doing this. Uh, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. Um, so my lecture notes are mutable and extensible. They're continuously revised, even after the lecture is given. They're commented on already, just because it happened in the class, revised and cross-linked and extended over the course of the semester by myself and the students. Over time, my notes are linked to their in-class lecture notes. This class is taught in the computer lab. They take notes while I talk in class or while we have conversations in the wiki. And I link those notes to my notes. And then I go in and I correct their misapprehensions of what I said and comment on that. And other students comment on my corrections and my commentary and so on. Every opportunity for re reworking and rethinking, all the revisionary potential and all the chances for the wit of the staircase, the really smart thing I should have said there to put that in later, it looks like I did. Because I did, because the class is still on go. It's all permitted and encouraged. All writing assignments are composed in the wiki and visible at every stage of completion to all the students in the class who are free and in fact encouraged, this is again a shift, a qualitative shift, to comment on and to cite hypertextually 
other students writing assignments in their own, um, whatever they find of value. Because of that, all assignments are submitted in two stages, or more than two stages, but an initial phase in which everybody can read for at least a week what you submitted as your midterm exam, let's say. Borrow from others and cite and copy and interleave, and then you get graded on the end result after a week and a half of revisions. Right? That's how that works. So whole thing's tangled together. <coughs> this symposium, in fact, my notes for this talk right here are already in the wiki. And uh, hopefully they'll be commented on and added to and changed. And I'll sound smarter after I revised it than perhaps I do now. Um, the same logic of revision and elaboration takes place. Now, some of what we're reading is not linkable inside the wiki, or it's not digital at all. But I don't consider that medium hybridity to be a problem, as I observed this morning, hybridity and the resistance to master and presents are aspects of the actual condition. So over time, the accretion of materials develops in layers, loops, and recursion. This is based upon the last time I did this, not this current semester. So those of you that are in the class right now, you shouldn't be too worried to have this happen yet. will. The unruly whole becomes itself more and more the recurring eccentric kernel of our discussions, the conditions of our discussions of the fictions and critical texts that we read together. Our collective reading experience drifts between qualities of just a semester-long cafe clutch, a degenerative chatter of Burke's parlor. David talked about, and an outright undisciplined and undisciplinable happy anarchy, as he also said this morning. Because happen and this is the thing, up to this point it's just a very elaborate set of course notes, so hundreds of pages will be generated over the course of the semester. Happy anarchy in this situation, this I take also be an aspect of social work. It's not a distraction or a problem. Happy anarchy is not something to be engineered out, smoothed out. It's the basic ethic of the course. Right? The readerly and writerly rambles, the aggregate threads, comments, and accretions of populate the course wiki are not adjuncts or enhancements of the primary labors of the course. I stress this from day one. In the course, the vasty, tangly, unruly, intertwinkled, Nelson would say, aggregate is the condition and the primary labor of reading in the class. It's the trace of a complex social relation. It's carried out in fits and starts, of digressions and concentrations within the window of a semester. My hope is to begin to combine these things into multi-semester long documents. And I, I'm even thinking next semester of allowing different classes to enter into other wikis and comment and add to it. So I see I think that this kind of thing, which which in some ways is a small version or a version using the tools we have here at UF of what I think is happening in some ways in social work, is the condition of what Greg calls electric pedagogy. Um, I have some ideas about where it might lead what hybridities and chimeras it might, uh, might produce, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave those aside. Um, so thank you, Bob, for your example, which inspired in part this. And uh, thank you for this. Well, just to leave from um, Gary, since electricity was involved in electric reading, the uh, you know, sort of uh, metaphysics of electricity is that uh, we, I call uh, the logic, I'm trying to we call it flash reason. Uh, the and, you know, the, the, what, we, the, what, what we are suggesting here, so here's what I'm asking uh, your advice or guidance on this, is you're creating more text, more and more and more text. And uh, I just participated with a group actually last year, uh, maybe some of you also attempted this, or just, uh, there was this grant possibility called Digging into Data. It was actually sponsored by the National Endowment for Humanities, among other institutions. And they, the title of the grant project was what do we do with the million books? And of course, we know from the statistics that uh, the Jay put the talk this morning, Google Books is already up to six million books, full, full text, digital search capabilities. And what what's happening there is the, the sort of assumption is that that number of books that are that are online available, nobody can read them. There are millions and millions of books uh, coming online. Not much has been not available before, without print, or books, whatever. Uh, so the problem is that we're that. Uh, is to you know, somehow take at least the initial semantic level and, and make that machine readable so that we can then sort of, you know, go to the top of that information and explosion and then start crossing the net. So my question is, how do you, what are your suggestions uh, for using the platforms and technology and so forth to deal with the fact that we have fast information explosion that we may actually drown in the amount of text we're producing rather than being able to use it? Um, two, two 
two, two, two things. One is that I expect that our reading behaviors are, they probably already are widely sort of, um, there are probably many behaviors under the word reading. But I think fundamentally it's going to bifurcate and we're, we're going to find that we read some things much more carefully than we did in the past and some things much more personally. Um, within Social Book, we're trying to sort of acknowledge that um, through this, this gloss system. I mean, the, the millions of books that exist, I, I'm not actually thinking that we're going to have machines parse them. I think we're going to have humans are going to go through and they're going to, I mean, I, I, I said a bunch of years ago, and I think I probably said this far a few months ago when I was here, that I would expect that some school in the next five to ten years will give a degree in reading. And what that means in a, one, of the, one of the skills will be the ability to gloss a, a text by saying, here are the 87 important passages, and here is why each of them is important. And when that has happened, you know, what we can imagine over the next hundred years that a lot of the corpus of analog culture will be glossed in that way, and future humans are going to be able to review much, much greater swaths of literature with intelligent guides at their side than they can now when they start from scratch. Um, so I think that it's, yes, we have more information, but the ability to have other people help us get through it is something that we will develop um, over time. I don't mean to make it sound simple, it isn't, but I, I don't, it, it doesn't frighten me that there's so much stuff out there when I think about the, because we, we've tried this, okay? We, 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 have, we put a document in the social book and somebody went there and they underlined all the passages they thought were important. And then I skimmed the document just reading what they had underlined. And two things happened. One was it was a decent way to scan the article, but I also had a good understanding of what their perspective was on it. That's in some ways the most important thing that we've discovered is that when you have several people in the margin you effectively have more eyes on the problem. And you know, our, our sense of truth in print, in the print world is, okay, so the author's up there, and she delivers the truth down here, in the same way that I deliver the truth out to you. Okay, and everything we see happening on the internet is sort of, goes in the other direction. It's that truth is something that we, can, that we construct collaboratively. And uh, I'm not sure how I can up in that question. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, how it's possible to ensure continued compatibility. So uh, it seems like being able to do this work now and yeah. have it help us out down the road. We've, or we've, I have a glib answer, which is that there will be standards that will emerge in the next, my guess is five years, because the groups are meeting now on annotations in online texts. Social book, and I imagine anybody else in this space, it doesn't make sense, it only makes sense for us to commit to adopting to those standards. So we will make it so that anything in social book, even today, will be converted into whatever that standard is. So that, because I, I am thinking a lot about my granddaughter Penelope, that you know I really want her to be able to read my stuff, and there's no chance that the e-reader that she's reading in will be the same as the one I'm in. So the question is, you know, will she be able to import my my notes into her copy? And that's our goal. Um, we think it can be done. Um, God knows it's not going to be trivial, but I think it's really important. 